Adults in Only Mode. Hello, welcome to Prairie Conservation Action Plan, Prairie's Got the Good Week. My name is Caitlin Morose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. This is the final webinar for Prairie's Got the Goods Week. Check out recordings from other webinars this week on PCAP's YouTube channel. I would like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by the University of Alberta. This project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now a bit about our presenter. Dr. Cameron Carlisle is an Assistant Professor of Rangeland Ecology at the University of Alberta in the Department of Agricultural, Food and Nutritional Sciences. Cam grew up in among the coast mountains of British Columbia but he has prairie roots and has long appreciated grassland ecosystems. His research examines the effects of climate change and land use on grassland ecosystem services. In particular, forage production, biodiversity, carbon storage, and pollination. He has also done research on plant competition, invasive species, and agroforestry systems. He teaches class classes on grassland ecology, rangeland conservation and management, and plant ecophysiology. Before we begin, I would like to mention that if you have any questions, please type it into the question section of your webinar dashboard. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And now I will pass it over to Cam. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you very much to uh, PCAP for this opportunity to uh, participate in this webinar series. Uh, this is a, an exciting new, new opportunity for me, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this turns out. Uh, I also think it's quite fitting that uh, a talk on biodiversity is wrapping up uh, a week looking at uh, ecosystem goods and services in grasslands. Um, Biodiversity in itself isn't usually considered to be a, uh, uh, an ecosystem goods and service, uh, but it is uh, important in supporting uh, the provision of ecosystem goods and services. Uh, and so that's one of the stories I hope to be able to tell to you uh, today. Uh, and so on my opening slide here, I have a whole bunch of photographs uh, just sort of representing uh, the wide variation in, in diversity that we can find uh, in grasslands. Uh, before I really get into it, um, I would just l like to acknowledge, um, oh, for some reason my slides are not advancing. Uh, there we go. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the whole host of other people that uh, have made uh, the research that I'm going to present today uh, possible. Uh, this involves uh, quite a few uh, colleagues uh, at the University of Alberta, uh, people at other organizations, uh, at Canada, Alberta Environment and Parks, uh, and then postdocs and uh, graduate students and undergraduate students uh, here at the U of A. Um, funding for this work uh, also has come from a, a diversity of sources. Um, in particular, funding uh, has come from the Alberta Livestock and Meat Agency, which is now uh, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, um, the Rangeland Research Institute here at the U of A, the University of Alberta itself, uh, Alberta Bioinnovates, uh, NSERC, um, the Agricultural Greenhouse Gases Program uh, from Ag Canada, the Alberta Conservation Association, and uh, the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, which is also a partner on some of our projects. So I won't dwell on it too, too much, but just a little bit of background, some um, things I would like you to take away when thinking about grasslands. Uh, they comprise an enormous amount uh, of the Earth's surface, depending on uh, how you do the, the, the counting and which types of ecosystems uh, you include. Um, but large amounts of these ecosystems have been lost. Um, you know, right here in Alberta, um, you know, anywhere from 60 to 95 percent 
of different grassland types um, have been lost, primarily through uh, conversion to, uh, to cropland systems. Um, you know, I, I titled my talk um, Biodiversity in Alberta's Grasslands, and it, that was probably an oversight on my part. Really, you know, when you look at the map, uh, the area on the map uh, that's yellow, uh, you know, sort of represents the dominant grassland areas of the province, and you can see that these extend right across through um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, into Manitoba. Uh, and these ecosystems themselves are, are very diverse. Uh, so here uh, in Alberta, here's just a few photographs sort of showing the diversity of grassland ecosystems that we have. Uh, towards the north, uh, we have the parkland ecosystem, and in the west, uh, along the uh, Rocky Mountains, we have the foothills. Um, both of these uh, start to intersperse with, with forests, uh, aspen stands in the parkland. Um, and really, the, these are wetter ecosystems. And then as we go to the south, we get into the mixed grass grasslands, as well as the very dry uh, mixed grass grasslands. And while all of these grasslands are dominated by herbaceous vegetation, there is a wide amount of uh, variability amongst them. They're all quite different uh, and dominated by, by different um, species of grasses. So, the theme of this talk is is biodiversity, and so I, I would like to just sort of start off with some some definitions around what biodiversity is and wh and what it all encompasses. Uh, the International Convention on Biological Di Diversity um, uh, provided a, a definition, which you can can read there. Uh, and really, what biodiversity is referring to is just all the variation um, that we have amongst living organisms, um, whether or not they're in aquatic or terrestrial ecos ecosystems. Um, but then these can also be measured, uh, biodiversity can also be examined at, at different levels. So we can look at uh, ecosystem diversity, uh, so that this is, you know, the combination of both the biotic and the abiotic uh, components together. So just as I illustrated that we have different types of grasslands, those are all different uh, types of ecosystems, and so we have diversity at that very large scale sort of level. Uh, at the very opposite end of sort of that scale uh, continuum, uh, we can think about genetic diversity, and this is the diversity um, that we find uh, you know, within a species, um, looking at genes and, and the variation of genes. Most of the time when we're thinking about biodiversity, though, we're, we're sort of thinking at that spot in the middle. We're thinking about uh, species diversity, and, and this is really just where um, we're thinking about the number of different species that are out there on the landscape. Uh, and for most of my talk, this is the level of bi um, biodiversity we're going to be looking at. Uh, on my next slide here, I just want to review some terminology because um, there's a few terms, uh, biodiversity, species richness, and diversity, uh, which I think are all, all different, and it's important to make distinctions uh, between them, uh, but they often get used interchangeably. Uh, so I've already given you the, the definition for, for, for biodiversity, um, but here I'd like to just emphasize that um, to me, and, and maybe not everyone would agree with this, the word biodiversity is really referring to that concept of um, the variety um, or is really referring to that concept of biological ver variation. Whereas when we get into using words like species richness and diversity, these are things that we can go out and, and measure. So species richness um, is just simply measuring the number of species within a community. So in that photograph of uh, the plant community I have there, we could sort through that photograph and we could look and count the number of different species in there. You know, we can see that there's a couple of different flowers, uh, there's quite a few different species of grasses, and we can add them all up. Uh, diversity, on the other hand, um, you know, takes into account uh, those species 
species that are there, the number of species that are there, but also incorporates another component, uh, which is the relative abundance uh, of each of those species. And there's many, many different ways to calculate uh, diversity. I, I've given one uh, sort of complex, complex formula for calculating diversity uh, there on the screen. Um, there's lots of ways to do it, but it takes into account uh, the relative abundance of each species. So it's entirely possible that you could have two different plant communities that have the same species richness, uh, but because of differences in the relative abundances of species within each of those communities, they'll have different diversity values. So going forward, hopefully I'll, I'll stick to my, my own definitions. Uh, quite often uh, in the figures that I present, they'll either be labeled uh, species richness or, or diversity. And, and quite often we think about these as the same thing, uh, but, but they are quite different, or at least a little bit different. So, um, you know, wh why do we... Why are we interested in, in looking at biodiversity? Um, in 1992, there was the, the Rio Convention uh, on Biodiversity happened, and, and ever since then, um, there's been an increasing focus on the importance of biodiversity. Uh, Canada has its own Canadian biodiversity strategy, uh, and this is tied into the fact that we're currently in the UN decade on biodiversity. So. As, um, as a global society, we have determined and decided that uh, biodiversity is an important thing uh, to look at. Uh, but what are some of the reasons for that? One, uh, people quite often cite the, the intrinsic value of biodiversity, so just the value that having different species out there has unto itself. Um, all week, um, through the PCAP event, We've been hearing about uh, ecosystem services and ecosystem functions, uh, and those contribute to human well-being. Uh, <clears throat> um, and so when we're thinking about biodiversity, because of the conversion of grasslands that I mentioned earlier, we've already started to see loss in, the, in habitat, and along with that, the number of species that are out there on the landscape. When we think about the Canadian prairies, there's a number uh, of notable uh, animals that, that have been extirpated from the ferries, black-footed fer ferrets, uh, prairie chickens, uh, and the, the uh, prairie population of grizzly bears are, are no longer here. Uh, and there's many, many more uh, threatened or endangered species. Um, but as those species start to uh, disappear, um, that can start to threaten the benefits that we get from these ecosystems in terms of the goods and services that they provide. Um, and so here, here's just the list. Uh, if you've been paying, if you've participated in some of the other webinars, you will have heard about some of these ecosystem goods and services. Uh, the main one in grasslands that we tend to think about is forage production, which contributes uh, to, to beef production. Uh, but we we'll also depend on them for carbon storage, greenhouse gas reduction, uh, pollination, uh, and there again, I have biodiversity there in brackets because it's really uh, helping to support these other ecosystem goods and services. Um, so ever since uh, the Rio Convention in 1992, that there has been an increased amount of research looking at the relationship between diversity uh, and ecosystem function or ecosystem services. Um, and this has really been based on uh, a, a couple of key points. One is understanding that humans have impacted biodiversity. Um, the activities that we have on the landscape have altered biodiversity. Um, many ecosystem functions are dependent on biodiversity. So the, the figure that's on the right here is showing this positive relationship between diversity uh, and ecosystem function. Um, so just that the number of, spe as we have more species, um, we tend to get greater function. That's not always the case, and I'll show a slide in a second uh, that, that demonstrates that. Uh, and then the last thing is that um, <clears throat> even though, um, the, the, well, the last point is really that it's not only diversity or just the number of species that matter, uh, the composition of species can matter as well. Uh, we know that human activities can change the composition of species that are out there on the landscape, uh, and if species change, that will affect some of the function. 
Uh, and so he, here's a figure from a study that was done in the UK where they looked at um, uh, diversity of a number of different taxes. So on this figure you can see um, uh, bees, butterflies, uh, plant diversity, um, freshwater um, insect diversity, uh, microbial diversity in the soil, uh, and then also overlaid on the same figure are different ecosystem functions. So that, that green line um, that's labeled C SLA is really, a, that's a, a proxy for plant productivity. Uh, we also have that black line on there that's showing uh, changes in carbon storage. Uh, and one of the things to take away from this figure uh, is that, you know, many of the, the, the species are showing this sort of hump-shaped relationship and some of the ecosystem functions like water quality are showing a similar relationship. So they tend to be, uh, that one in this case is at least lockstep uh, in line with some of these diversity measures. Um, but those other measures like CSLA and carbon storage, uh, you know, they're really going off in one direction or the other. And so they're not necessarily tied to biodiversity. Uh, um, in the same way. Uh, and that's just the case uh, in this particular study. There's other examples where things like productivity are in fact tied to overall bio biodiversity. Uh, but I just wanted to make the point that these aren't always uh, um, following that, that positive relationship. Okay, so I'm going to sort of move out of my, my introductory slides here and just start uh, going into some of the, the, the research that we've done uh, looking at, at biodiversity and grasslands. Um, there's a f sort of, there's three overarching questions that uh, we've tried to address um, with our research. Um, the first one is, you know, what are the patterns of diversity in grasslands? So, you know, how many species are actually out there or what are the patterns of diversity? Um, the second one is, how does the diversity of rangelands compare to other land uses? And the third one is, you know, how, you know, the, the major land use uh, in, our, in our prairies is, um, is grazing of cattle. Uh, and so how can we use grazing management to increase or maintain uh, diversity in, in this landscape? Or what are the effects of grazing on uh, diversity in this landscape? So I'm... The way I'm going to move through this is I'm going to go through a number of uh, different taxa. Um, I'm going to start off with, with plants. Um, you know, pretty much in all of the research that we do, we, we, we look at, at, at plants. And so they're sort of our, our bread and butter. Uh, and so as I've already said, uh, plant diversity um, and plants are important primarily um, from an ecosystem function point of view for providing the uh, providing forage for, for livestock uh, and, and wildlife. Um, <clears throat> and th there's a number of patterns that we tend to see uh, with increasing diversity uh, in the plant community. Uh, first off is just an increase in the types of uh, functions that we get from the plants. So for example, uh, the uh, the, the plant in the very top uh, right photo is um, is a legume, um, and as we add more and more species into a community, we're more and more likely to get plants that have different functions. Uh, and so, with higher diversity, we're more likely to have a legume in that community. And of course, legumes provide uh, an important uh, ecosystem function uh, by helping to bring uh, nitrogen into the system. Uh, a second um, benefit that often arises with plant diversity is uh, stability. Uh, so plant diversity can help make uh, systems more resistant uh, to environmental change. Uh, and so the, uh, the figure on the right here uh, is a profile view showing uh, the variation in rooting depth of different plants. And so uh, if you were to take a situation of a drought uh, where water starts to become limited, uh, having a diversity of plants that have variation in their rooting depth uh, can allow some of those plants uh, to persist during those uh, drought conditions. And so, um, whereas if you had a, a monoculture, uh, if environmental cha uh, conditions change to a situation that didn't support uh, that single species, you know, all of your function uh, could be lost. 
Whereas with a diversity of plants, you're more likely to have some that are able to tolerate uh, environmental change and continue to provide some of the functions that are important. So one of the first things we did um, in trying to look at, and one of the first things we really need to do in trying to understand uh, biodiversity and grasslands is just to understand the, uh, the, the basic pattern of plant diversity that's out there. Uh, and one of the, for a long time, one of the major predictors, or what is thought to be one of the major predictors of overall plant diversity is, um, is productivity, or the total amount of pl uh, plant biomass. Uh, and so this figure here, uh, I know there's a lot going on in it. Um, th this is uh, the result of a study we participated in. It was led by uh, Lachlan Fraser at Thompson Rivers University. Uh, in, in BC, uh, and it involved participants from 30 countries, over 30 countries uh, from all over the world, uh, where we all did the same sampling in grasslands, trying to understand you know, what is the global pattern of plant species richness in relation to plant productivity. Uh, and by and large, uh, what this figure is showing is that there's a hump-shaped relationship between the number of species and uh, total biomass such that uh, we get the maximum number of species at some intermediate level of, of plant biomass. Uh, and we, we see that pattern uh, here in Alberta uh, and the, uh, the inset bar graph here is showing that that is the that red bar is showing that this relationship is the dominant one that, that we see all over the world. So it's important that we have a, a baseline understanding of some of the patterns of plant diversity um, so that we can start to understand uh, what's going on when they change and that we have a reference point um, as we look to see how land use changes um, these patterns. So um, uh, a few years ago when I was still in, in BC, uh, I, I also looked at the, this relationship um, I looked at uh, areas that were low productivity, areas that were sort of medium productivity, and areas that were high productivity, uh, and looked at uh, species richness. And so this is what we're seeing in the bar graph here. And so even though it's not a continuous line, we're still seeing that, that peak sort of shape um, that I showed you on the previous graph where diversity uh, of plants are, is, is highest at intermediate levels. Uh, and then is lower at low productivity and lower at, at high productivity. Um, but what we're interested in is, is whether grazing changes this relationship, and this is what we found. Uh, when we add grazing into the mix and we look at areas where the, there is grazing, um, we see that that relationship changes. Uh, in those high productivity areas, the introduction of grazing uh, actually increases the, the total number of species. Uh, the usual uh, explanation that's given for this is that uh, the addition of grazing um, reduces the competitive ability of dominant plants, uh, allowing subordinate plants uh, to enter into the system. There could be other reasons uh, as well. Uh, and we see this pattern uh, here in Alberta too. Uh, again, we, we looked at ungrazed and grazed areas across the province, um, and by and large, um, we see the same pattern hold as well. When we have grazing in the system, we have more species of plants than we do uh, if we don't have grazing. Uh, this pattern in our study was only significant in the parkland and the, the foothills fescue uh, regions of the province. That's what those asterisks over the bars are indicating. Uh, but if you look across all the other regions, uh, we tend to see that at least the trend uh, towards this pattern. Uh, so those previous two studies were only looking at areas that were grazed or not grazed. Um, what about if we start taking into account uh, grazing intensity? So um, uh, we've done a few studies looking at the relationship between range health uh, and diversity. Uh, and here is just an example uh, from the foothills uh, fescue region of the province. Uh, looking at, across the bottom, we have the, the number of survey plots. So as we start, um, so uh, the one is we just looked at the number of species in one plot. 
uh, the two on the bottom axes as we looked at the number of species uh, that we found uh, across two different plots. Uh, and what you can see here is that generally as you look in more and more plots, you start to see uh, increasing numbers of species. Uh, and this is what we would expect. This is just a matter of, of effort. As you put in more effort into looking, you're going to find more species. But um, when we do this in areas that are, are rated unhealthy, uh, according to a, a range health survey, uh, that, that's the green line on the, this figure, uh, and compare it to areas that are healthy, the blue line, or healthy with problems, the, the red line, we, we see that there's differences. And there's two important distinctions to see uh, with that green line in the unhealthy region. First off, um, it's, it's lower than the other two lines, uh, indicating that we have fewer species. Uh, but also, it's starting to asymptote. It's starting to level off. Whereas the other two lines, uh, if we were to con continue to add more plots, um, we would very likely continue to find more and more species. Uh, so, um, areas that are c considered healthy or healthy with problems are, seem to be uh, similar to each other, um, but areas that are overgrazed and categorized as unhealthy um, have fewer species. Uh, this, again, this is for the foothills, but this pattern tended to hold in other parts of the province as well. Um, this figure is another way to look at uh, community structure. Uh, here across the bottom is the, the ranking of all of the different uh, species that we find. So on the very left side of the graph, uh, the species that's number one would be the, the most abundant species uh, in the plant community. Uh, the one that's listed at over at 60 would be the least uh, abundant species. Uh, and then on the side axis, we have their actual abundance, uh, which in this case is a, is a measure of, of cover. And again, um, my apologies, the colors of the lines uh, have switched from the previous graph. Here the blue line is unhealthy, the red and the green are healthy and healthy with problems. Uh, but what this is showing us is that you know, that blue line is very steep compared to the other two lines, indicating that the, the structure of the community has shifted. It's really dominated by very few species, uh, whereas the healthy and um, healthy with problems communities, um, you know, the, while they will still have a dominant species, uh, the dominance of that dominant species is reduced, and we get to um, we're, we're finding those, those rarer and less common species in these communities as well, whereas those ones start to disappear uh, out of the unhealthy communities. So the, the whole community structure has been shifted. Uh, when we're looking at plants, um, you know, uh, three slides black, back, I showed you that uh, we see an increase um, with moderate levels of grazing in most parts uh, of the prairies. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is, you know, what are those species that, that are leading to that increase uh, in the number of, of species? Uh, and the concern is, is that they're, they're introduced or non-native or in invasive species. Uh, so we looked at that, that pattern and that's what this graph is showing. Uh, the black line on this graph is areas that weren't grazed, the green dashed line is areas that were grazed, uh, and the side axis is uh, the proportion of that diversity that's due to uh, non-native species. Um, and we plotted this against uh, growing season precipitation. What we can see here is that in wetter parts of the province, uh, with grazing, the um, proportion of our diversity uh, that's coming from introduced species is starting to increase. Um, for the most part, um, these species tend to be uh, agronomic plants, uh, such as uh, timothy or, or smooth brome or uh, poa pretensis. Uh, and some of those species you know, have a lot of value for, uh, as, a, as a forage, um, but they could be changing other components of the, uh, of the community as well. Uh, so we did another study uh, looking at uh, Sicer milk vetch, um, which, is a not, which is an agronomic species, uh, an agronomic legume. Um, it's invaded onto one of the University of Alberta's uh, ranches, and so we were, we were curious about 
what its um, overall effects on the, the plant community were. Uh, were. Uh, and so here's just a picture of the plant. You can see that it, it's, it's quite large um, and it's quite tall compared to most of the other vegetation that's um, naturally occurring on, on the ranch. Um, so we, we looked at areas where the, the Cicer milk vetch had invaded and in areas where uh, it wasn't present. Uh, and in these first two graphs, you can see that um, the, the yellow bars are much higher. Those are the areas with the Cicer milk vetch. They're really contributing to overall uh, forage quantity. Uh, and that because it's a legume, it's also fairly high uh, in protein. Uh, and because of its uh, mass, it's really adding a lot in terms of the amount of protein that's available on, on the landscape. So from one perspective, uh, from a grazing management perspective, uh, you might be quite happy to have this plant um, uh, in your pastures because it's going to add a lot um, uh, for livestock. Uh, on the other hand, though, um, here we have measures of uh, diversity and species richness, and you can see in both cases uh, diversity and species richness decline where we have that, that Cicer milk vetch. Um, and so, that, you know, the, the, this is undesirable. Um, and then in the next figure here, I'm going to take a second, uh, again, still looking at Cicer milk vetch, I'm just going to take a second to put this figure together because I'll have a few other figures that are, are similar. And if you haven't dealt with these figures before, they can take a minute to wrap your head around. Uh, so this is an ordination. Um, these uh, points that I've just added into it are, represent um, plots of uh, native grass. Um, so, the, And the closer that two points are to each other, the similar they are in terms of the composition of, of plants uh, that are there. Uh, so two points that are side by side are very similar to each other, two points that are far apart are very different from each other. Uh, these yellow points are all the Cicer milk vetch plots. Uh, you can see they've all clustered down in one corner. Uh, really that's being driven because uh, Cicer milk vetch uh, is in there. Uh, but then we can overlay some of those other values we've already looked at. Um, forage quantity and quality are really associated with the Cicer milk vetch plants. Uh, diversity is not associated with the Cicer milk vetch plants. It was actually associated with areas that were dominated by, um, by, by stipa, one of the, the native grasses. Uh, and one of the other um, ecosystem goods and services, carbon, uh, was really associated by areas that had lots of uh, blue grama. Um, but again, not in areas with the Cicer milk vetch. Uh, so, you know, here we have a plant that could be benef beneficial, but it's negative, negatively impacting diversity. Uh, as well as carbon storage. Um, and so in that case, we need to start thinking about, you know, how do we want to manage our landscape and, and what are our goals for it? Um, Jessamine Manson earlier in the week gave a talk on po pollinators. She and I have collaborated on a, a couple of studies looking at them uh, in grasslands. I'll just give the highlights of, of, this, of this work. Um, but and if you're interested in more, uh, I encourage you to check out her, her talk, which has been posted on online. Um, uh, she, she'll give you much more details than I'll give you here. So uh, native bees um, are really important as pollinators um, in grasslands. Any, um, any forb, uh, for the most part, is going to be de dependent on some form of insect uh, pollinator. Uh, and in grasslands, by and large, uh, bees are the, the main pollinators of most plants. Uh, but of course, uh, if you've been listening to the news, um, you're well aware that, that honeybees uh, and other bees are threatened by land use change, climate change, patho pathogens, and uh, pesticide use. So we did a, a survey of native bees in grasslands and canola fields uh, right across uh, the province. Um, and part of our motivation for this is because there haven't been a lot of uh, surveys done uh, in grasslands previously. Um, and the, the collections that have been done are limited in both space uh, and time. Um, and we don't have a good idea of what's currently out there right now. Um, and so what, what we found, uh, again, we looked at, at range health 
actually, before I get into this, I'll just say we, you know, we found uh, over 230 species um, just here in, in Alberta of bees, um, you know, which is a, a staggering uh, number, and it took a, an enormous amount of effort to actually uh, start to ID them all. Uh, and we looked at, um, within our grassland areas, uh, the re relationship of that to range health, both bee abundance, the number of bees, and the number of different species of bees, uh, both increased with um, increasing uh, range health scores. Uh, so that's good. That shows that uh, range management um, and appropriate range management uh, can have positive effects on, on bee, um, bee communities. Um, this figure, again, is similar to the, the one I constructed earlier. Uh, just looking at differences in the bee communities, the, uh, the big oval I've thrown up there is circling all the sites that had uh, a healthy, um, were, had a healthy evaluation um, under, under a range health assessment. Um, and so you, and whereas all the ones uh, below that oval were either rated as uh, healthy with problems or, or unhealthy. Um, and so you can see, uh, you know, changes in range management aren't only changing the, the abundance and the number of species that are out there, it's also affecting uh, the composition of, of that community as, as well. Uh, and, and that could have impacts on, on plants um, and, the, and, uh, and the, the pollination and the, the reproductive success of, of flowers uh, in these systems. Uh, and just one final note, we compared, uh, we looked at areas that were surrounded by grassland and compared them to areas that had um, uh, cropland around them. Uh, and the more grassland a location had around it, uh, the more bees and, and the more species um, of bees uh, that we found at those locations. Again, just sort of uh, reinforcing that, that need for, for conservation of grasslands. Um, <clears throat> One of the, the last tacks I want to talk about uh, very quickly is uh, soil microbial diversity. Uh, these are um, really microorganisms living in the soil. Uh, they compri comprise an enormous amount of uh, biomass, um, but they're not very well studied. Uh, in grasslands, it can, it's estimated that there can be a, a few thousand kilograms uh, of microbial biomass uh, in the top layer of soil. Uh, in a hectare, um, but we, we really don't know a whole lot about how many um, different types of organisms are out there, um, how they respond to uh, environmental change or land use change, uh, and what all of their roles are in uh, ecosystem, proce ecosystem processes, even though they're incredibly um, important for, for all of the processes that happen in the soil. Uh, nutrient cycling, uh, decomposition, um, uh, the critical for, for assisting plant growth, um, all of those types of things that happen in the soil. So, um, so we, we've looked at this, um, we're start, and we're starting to look at this increasingly in quite a few of our projects, looking especially at carbon uh, storage and carbon cycling. Um, here, again, is another one of those, those ordinations. Um, just looking at um, how the microbial community responds to uh, differences in, in land use change. So all of the colorful points, the, the red ones, the blue ones, and the, the pink ones here are, are forested areas. The, um, the points captured uh, by the, uh, the lime green oval and the lime green triangles, those are our grassland locations. And then the, uh, the X's and the pluses under the, the dark green oval are, are cropland. Uh, and so you can see that you know, there's a difference in the microbial community um, <clears throat> uh, under the cropland and, and under, under grasslands. And so what, what the implications are for um, the, those ecosystem processes, uh, we don't ne necessarily uh, we don't necessarily know, uh, even though uh, we've started to do work um, that has shown that many of these uh, microbially driven ecosystem processes 
uh, are affected by land use and, and they are affected by by grazing and so here's just a few examples I won't get into the the uh, the details of these figures uh, but extracellular enzymes are uh, chemicals um, put out into the soil by um, microorganisms to help them uh, digest different materials uh, and here we see that the presence of, of grazing uh, affects the the abundance of some of those enzymes uh, we see uh, that decomposition rates um, change uh, in areas that are grazed or not grazed uh, and we see that greenhouse gas flux um, uh, changes so that in that figure at the bottom the red line is areas that are grazed and the blue line is areas that are not grazed we're actually seeing lower greenhouse gas flux uh, out of soils that are that are grazed than ones that that aren't um, and so the the role of microbial diversity um, and um, the composition of microbial communities in, in those processes uh, in relation to grazing is something we really need to look at a, a little bit more. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I'm going to shift gears uh, as I start to wrap things up here. I'm going to talk about a, a project that we've termed the uh, the Beef and Biodiversity Project. And so uh, I'm going to start off with a, a figure that from a, a paper that was published uh, in 2014 uh, by a research group out, out of the US and uh, what they were looking at is that they were looking at the the impacts of different types of um, different types of livestock production on on land water use greenhouse gases um, and, and, and nitrogen uh, and they compared beef production to dairy, to poultry, to pork, uh, and to eggs. Uh, and I, I guess um, <clears throat> you know, you know I, I find some fault with this study. Um, there is no doubt that um, you know beef production in uh, grasslands, you know, has some impact on the environment. Um, there are there are greenhouse gases gases that come from, from cattle, uh, there is water use associated with uh, beef production, there is um, issues surrounding uh, manure management. Um, I don't want to get into all those other things. The one thing I really want to focus on uh, is this bar right here uh, where they are essentially saying that the land used uh, in, um, in beef production uh, is, is really a, a liability. Uh, whereas I, I would make the argument that the at least in the Canadian prairies uh, the grasslands uh, and even the tame pasture that are used to to raise beef are are actually an, an asset um, you know if beef wasn't being raised on those lands uh, they might very well be converted uh, to crops um, which is going to have a different value for biodiversity. Uh, and in this paper, they even went so far to say that livestock production competes with biodiversity uh, and promotes uh, species extinction. Uh, and so the, the Beef and Biodiversity uh, Project is really about um, evaluating that uh, and evaluating uh, beef production um, through its whole cycle, you know, right from, from pasture uh, through to feedlots, uh, and distribution of, of products um, on on, biodi by, on biodiversity. Uh, so there, there's three parts to this project. I'll go through them one by one uh, fairly quickly here. Uh, our partner on this project is the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. Uh, so the map there is showing uh, study sites that they've established where they survey biodiversity across the, the province of Alberta. Um, and so we're, we're using uh, the data that they have um, to compare uh, grassland biodiversity values to other types of, of land uses, whether it's cropland. Um, it will be predominantly cropland, but it could also include uh, urban areas or, or uh, industrial areas. And so um, this biodiversity data includes um, assessments of vascular plants, um, any evidence of mammals, uh, bird counts, uh, and also some unusual taxa. Uh, you can see the pictures there of 
uh, a lichen and, and a mite. So they have uh, data on, on all those taxa. Uh, the second part of the project, I've actually shown you a little bit uh, of this, uh, is looking at range health assessments uh, as, as a way to evaluate management practices and look at the relationship between range health uh, management and, and overall biodiversity. Uh, so there's two parts to this. One is uh, we actually went out and we've measured range health um, at some of those ABMI sites, and we're going to relate those range health scores to overall scores of biodiversity. Uh, and the second part is looking at actual management practices in place um, that are done by producers at those locations uh, through a survey, and then starting to tie uh, some of those management practices uh, to biodiversity. Uh, the final part of the project is a life cycle assessment. Uh, so a life cycle assessment uh, if you're not aware, uh, it's just a process that can look at the overall uh, impact of a, of a product's development um, on, on any number of things. So, so quite often, you know, the, the example I always use is, you know, we can track the production of, of a light bulb in terms of all the energy that's used uh, to produce that light bulb. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is look at the entire um, beef production system, which is, is quite complex. You know, it has pastures, native grassland, tame pasture, feed lots, um, and grains um, that are raised and grown in croplands that are, are part of the the feed for animals are all part of the, the beef production systems and all of those different land components are going to have uh, different impacts on biodiversity and so we're trying to put together a, a life cycle approach to evaluate the impact of beef production on biodiversity uh, and then also use that same approach to compare it um, beef production to other land uses so that we really have a, a full and complete understanding of what uh, beef production's impact on biodiversity is. So um, just one last slide here uh, just to sort of uh, summarize everything. Uh, hopefully I've shown you that uh, grasslands are diverse ecosystems and that they contain a uh, a wide variety uh, of different organisms in them, uh, which is also contributing to their diversity. Uh, <clears throat> uh, grassland conversion ha has led to species loss, and we've even seen uh, within some of our work that um, uh, conversion or loss of grasslands leads to, uh, to, to lower uh, diversity. Um, human land use, so whether that's um, grazing management or other land uses um, not only affects diversity, but it can also affect uh, community composition. Uh, and those changes in diversity or uh, community composition are also leading to changes uh, in ecosystem uh, functions and ser services. Um, but grazing on grasslands uh, can also be uh, compatible uh, with biodiversity. You know, we've seen that moderate uh, levels of grazing uh, can lead to increases in plant diversity. Uh, areas that have high range health scores tend to have higher um, uh, bee diversity. Um, and then the, the last point I just want to end with is if we're going to try and understand uh, biodiversity, we need some level uh, of monitoring uh, on the landscape. Uh, you know, we are aware of some of the, the larger organisms that, that we've lost out of these landscapes, like uh, grizzly bears or ferrets. Um, but, you know, bees and other insects um, and microorganisms, which could be uh, equally vital to uh, ecosystem uh, services and functions, uh, we know much, much less about. And we won't know what we've lost uh, unless we keep an eye on them. So uh, with that, um, I am done. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I think I'll be taking some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlisle. That is a really excellent presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, for our listeners out there, if you have any questions, please type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. And just a reminder that this presentation has been recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, we do have one question at the moment. Um, in your opinion, 
what can be done to better protect grassland biodiversity in Alberta and Saskatchewan? <laughs> that, that, that's the big one. That's the, the key one. I think, um, you know, there have been, uh, when we look at the species that have been lost, one of the major contributing factors has been uh, habitat loss. Um, and we know that, that we have lost uh, extensive amounts uh, of these grasslands and they're um, unfortunately can continuing to be be lost. Uh, there's been a number of reports that have come out over the last uh, little while indicating that grassland conversion is continuing to happen. Um, you know, a lot of my other research is, is looking at carbon storage and sequestration and trying to develop uh, carbon offset payments uh, that could be uh, paid for beneficial grazing management practices uh, that help um, producers and, and landowners, um, you know, maintain their operations and help them to conserve grasslands. Um, you know, I, I think we need to start looking towards s some of those um, more innovative policies uh, to help us conser conserve these ecosystems. Because the, the reality is, um, you know, be uh, beef production just doesn't quite pay what, um, what crops do, and uh, as long as there's that, that differential there, um, there's going to continue to be uh, impetus to convert uh, some of these lands into uh, other land types. Mm. Thank you. Um, it doesn't look like there are any more questions, so with that, um, oh, actually, sorry, spoke too soon. One just popped up here um, from a listener named Danielle. There is some contradiction in published studies regarding the beneficial and detrimental impacts of beef production on biodiversity. Why do you believe this contradiction, contradiction exists, and what are the main aspects of biodiversity to be studied to find out more about the relation between biodiversity and livestock? Okay, so we'll try and... So I, I think there's, there's there's two questions there. So the, the first one is, um, you know, that is related to that 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 paper by Eschel that I that I discussed, where they they came up with this statement saying that, um, you know, livestock production is really at odds with biodiversity. That that study was done uh, entirely in the U.S. Um, so the to me, that conclusion was a little bit surprising. But when you look at um, more global beef production, there are some parts of the world where uh, beef production probably is at odds with uh, biodiversity. So areas in, in South America, you know, you know, we've heard for a long time about uh, destruction of, of rainforests, uh, <clears throat> and, and whereas here in, in North America, you know. Most of our grazing is happening on a, a landscape that, that evolved with grazing long before uh, where cattle were, were there. So I think that's part of where the discrepancy is coming from. It depends if people who are looking at these patterns are sort of taking that uh, a global view of uh, impacts of, of production on biodiversity, or if they're looking at some of the, the more the details at a more lo local level. You know, our alternative land use uh, here for, for grassland, the, the dominant one is, is a cropland, which, um, you know, the, the biodiversity value of that is probably much, much less. Uh, the, the second question, I think, was related to uh, what would be a good indicator of, um, of, of biodiversity loss. Uh, and and that, that's a, a complicated question. When we look at uh, the the assumption has usually been that you know we can find uh, a taxa that will help us understand overall patterns, and that is sometimes the case, but it but it all isn't always the the case. Um, so we need to find. So we either need to measure everything, which is uh, very difficult, or we need to find some, some sort of proxy measurement. The easiest thing to measure is probably pl plant diversity. Most of the time, that uh, and maybe because that's my background, that would be my my default uh, to to measure. Um, but choosing the best uh, 
indicator can be tricky. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, another question from Danielle. Do you believe functional diversity is a good indicator in view of the lack of consensus existing in functional diversity? Oops, sorry, I used to scroll down here. Um, um, in view of the lack of consensus existing in functional diversity measures and data needs? Uh, well, so, yeah, so, so functional diversity is a as opposed to uh, species diversity is just looking at the, uh, the, the functions or the processes that di different species facilitate. Um, and whether it's better or not, I'm not sure. That, that's really going to depend on, on what we're valuing. If our end value is uh, the maintenance of ecosystem services um, and ecosystem functions, uh, then maybe uh, functional di diversity is, is sufficient uh, because uh, that's more re related uh, to the, the end measure or our end goals. Uh, but if we're more interested in diversity uh, unto itself, um, th then it's going to be insufficient because uh, functional diversity isn't going to capture the diversity of species that we have out there and it's not necessarily going to capture uh, genetic or, or even ecosystem uh, diversity as well. So I, I think it, it really depends on your end goals. Great, thank you. And Danielle also says thanks. Uh, there's a question here from a listener named Karen. Do you think that a carbon credit may be a good way to get producers to consider implementing better grazing practices or even convert cropland back into rangeland? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, carbon offset payments could be very valuable um, in providing some incentive to uh, maintaining grasslands uh, and to um, uh, converting grasslands back. Restoration is, is you know, is expensive. Um, maintaining uh, the carbon that we already have in the ground uh, is, is a much better way. Uh, we have a number so actually, I'll plug one of my colleagues from earlier in the week. Uh, check out Dr. Edward Bork's uh, talk on carbon. He's probably given a, a lot. Uh, he'll give a lot more uh, on the topic. And um, <clears throat> uh, and we have a we have a few studies that are starting up, looking at uh, different grazing practices um, and whether or not they actually lead to increases in carbon storage. And if they do. Uh, then yeah, absolutely. I think we should uh, try and enact policy that will provide uh, offsets uh, to support uh, carbon sequestration uh, in grasslands in order to help uh, with grassland conservation. Great. Thank you very much. Um, with that, uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions at the moment, so I would just like to remind our listeners that when you leave this presentation, this webinar, you will receive a quick survey, and if everyone doesn't mind taking a minute to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. It would help us out to be able to do this event again. Um, and if anyone has any questions now, you're welcome to type it in. Um, and again, this presentation will be uploaded to YouTube. Also, I'd like to ask our listeners to check out the Prairie Conservation Action Plan Facebook page. Uh, we keep it up to date with all sorts of events going on. Uh, it doesn't look like there are any more questions coming in. So with that, um, Dr. Cameron Carla, I would like to thank you very, very much for the excellent presentation. I think it was a perfect way to end our week about Prairie's Got the Good. So thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and happy St. Patty's Day, everyone. Thank you. You too. And thank you to all of our listeners out there for tuning in. And have a great rest of your day, and have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.